Hello and welcome to this digital event from the British Library. My name is Jonah Albert and I am one of the library's cultural events producers. This evening we are joined by David Olasoga in conversation with Omar Khan on why black history matters. I'd like to say welcome to um, the Living Knowledge Network, a network of libraries across the country who are with us today. Thank you guys for joining us, welcome. Use the menu above to um, provide us with feedback. Also to visit the bookshop where you can find a few of David's books and also to donate to the British Library. The British Library is a charity. Um, I would like now to hand over to Omar Khan as we begin this evening's event. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Omar Khan. I'm, I have the pleasure and honor of uh, chairing today's event, this evening's British Library event, Black History Matters, a conversation with David Olasoga. Before we begin, I've got a few housekeeping bits. I think most of you are all familiar with Zoom. I think there's uh, 2,000 of you on the Zoom call. Uh, that might be, that's definitely a record uh, for me, maybe not for David. Um, but let me just uh, give you a few housekeeping uh, notes for this Zoom event. So first, I want to welcome people from the Living Knowledge Network. They're joining us uh, via the British Libraries partnerships with libraries across the UK. And obviously, one advantage of doing events online is uh, we, we can do events where people don't just have to come to London. Um, uh, the second thing I want to note is there are captions uh, for this event. It uh, has a live speech-to-text ca speech captioning. It's accessed by a tab below the video if you'd like to use it. And finally, um, at the end, there will be an opportunity to ask questions uh, directly of, of David. Um, to, you can, but you can start asking those questions uh, immediately. You scroll below the video to fill out a question form and those questions uh, will be posed to David. Obviously it's going to be, he won't be able to answer all of them but we will tr do our best to make sure that uh, they are addressed. So that, with those preliminaries out of the way, I'm gonna quickly introduce David. I'm sure most of you uh, know him. That's, you're, you're here for the event for. Um, Professor David Olsoga is a British Nigerian historian, broadcaster and BAFTA award-winning presenter and filmmaker. He's professor of public history at the University of Manchester and a regular contributor to papers including The Guardian, The Observer, New Statesman, and BBC History Magazine. He's the author of several books, including Black and British, A Forgotten History, and A House Through Time. He was also a contributor to the Oxford Companion to Black British History. In 2019, he was awarded the OBB for Services to History and Community Integration. David's new children book, Black and British, A Short Essential History, has recently been published, uh, and I'm looking forward to getting that for my eight-year-old. So um, welcome, David. Hi there, how are you doing? Great. So um, as the event sort of previewed, I think one of the reasons uh, we're having this conversation about Black History Matters is it's Black History Month. Um, and this, arguably this year, is a, is a particular context for Black History Month with the murder of George Floyd, arguably greater recognition in Britain that the issue of racism um, is still one that matters here in the UK. Have you noticed that this has made any difference in how we think about or talk about black history for this Black History Month in 2020? Well, I think the contrast between the previous Black History Months is even more stark because the last two were enormously overshadowed by the Windrush scandal. I remember the Black History Month of 2018, I gave several talks around the country um, and I was making a program at the time about people whose lives had been torn apart by the scandal. And I was absolutely furious and um, everyone was angry. Everyone was, one was emotional. So I think we have a real extreme contrast between those two very fraught Black History Months and this year when I think there's more reasons to be hopeful. I don't think there are reasons to be sort of overconfident, um, but I think there are reasons to say that the conversations we've had about race, that the changes that we've seen in the national discourse about race, some have been very negative. A lot of them have been incredibly positive. I mean, if somebody had told me in January that um, by the summer, there would be weeks and weeks in which half the books in the Sunday Times bestseller list would be books about black history and race and structural racism, I would have thought it was naive. If somebody had told me that there'd be demonstrations all over the world in the name of anti-racism, I would have said that sounded far-fetched. If somebody had told me back in January that the statue of Edward Colston that had stood for 125 years over the city of Bristol, where I'm talking to you from this evening, that that statue would be toppled, 
um, and that one of the organizations that had defended the reputation of a slave trader for 275 years would disband itself. All of those things sounded utterly naive and implausible in January, yet all of those things have happened. And just acknowledging what has happened, that in itself, I think, is reason to be more optimistic than we have been um, or have had reason to be in the previous couple of Black History Months. Yeah, and the way you, you rightly tell that, I mean, obviously there is the link there being made between the history, the, the evidence of Colston being a slave trader, and the present, the attitudes that end up justifying the dehumanization of, of George Floyd and, and all those uh, murdered by the police. I mean, do you think we're, we're getting there? We're getting to that conversation? Because with Windrush, I, I still feel that there's a resistance to unpicking that history in terms of explaining the injustice that happened in the present. Yeah. Well, I think the ignorance of history is one of the reasons why the Windrush scandal happened. I think if you read the Lessons Learned Review commissioned by Savage Javid when he's Home Secretary and carried out by Wendy Williams, that report comes very close to saying that the Home Office was institutionally racist. It doesn't actually say it, but it comes close to saying it. And what it what it recounts is people not understanding the history. They don't understand the history of the empire. They don't understand the role, the place of the Caribbean and the people of the Caribbean in the story of empire. And they certainly didn't understand, and I, this is what I find most shocking, they don't understand the history of immigration law since 1948 and the passing of the British um, uh, Nationality Act. So it was an inability to really understand who these people were what their place in Britain's story was that was one of the engines for the Windrush scandal. So this, this disconnect between the history and the present, this disconnect between the, the, the historical engines that generated the racial thinking and the stereotypes that disfigure our society and the existence of those stereotypes and, and, um, and, and distortions. That's, I think some of that has been reconnected this year. I mean, the, I mean it was amazing when Colston's statue um, was toppled because I did interviews for newspapers and for television channels all over the world in Europe and America. And the big, the thing that surprised people um, was not that the statue had been toppled, but that it, was, it had been there in the first place. And the question, I think a lot of people had bought the image that we'd sell, sent out to the world at the beginning of the Olympics in 2012, that this young, dynamic, tolerant multicultural country that was in love with its own self-image of, of, of tolerance, inclusiveness, and creativity. And that sat very badly with the fact that a man who was the deputy governor of the Royal African Company, the company that transported more people into slavery than any in British history, had been not just put up in a British city, it had been kept up and it had been defended resolutely by five organizations who's, who've created a, a cult uh, a cult of worship of a mass murderer. Um, people were just couldn't understand how we could not see this. It was slightly embarrassing to be, um, it was slightly odd position for me to be in her trying to feeling defensive about Britain um, when I'd been calling for that statue to be, um, come down for years. But it was, it was a really powerful moment because it, it, it was, it was a realization that more people were understanding this history and these links. You had a you had a, a group of young people at a moment when black people were suffering more than any other group in the pandemic, in a city that has a deep division and residential segre segregation, um, a city that that has been in report after report said to disadvantage the lives of of black and brown people, targeting somebody who was responsible for the industry that generated those racial ideas in the first place. So it was kind of layers of history and symmetry and poetry. It was a remarkable event. Yeah, and it gives lie to the sort of, uh, what I would almost call a straw man argument that we're trying to erase history by taking down Colston because that is about excavating the ideas that continue. Um, I mean, I don't know if you wanna say anything in response to that kind of criticism. Here is a professional historian, a professor, saying that we should take down statues and erase history. Um, what, what would you say in response to that? Well, I mean, the, the answer is, is easy. It's the thing I've sort of said for years on platform after platform is statues aren't history. And the people who are talking about what we should do with these statues tend to be historians. They tend to be people who've spent their entire professional lives generating history, writing books, going to archives, uncovering documents, producing television programs. 
it's a very odd way to destroy history. If I'm really opposed to history, I could think of more destructive ways of taking my, uh, my vengeance out on history than writing history books and making history programs. Monuments and statues are not history. They're about memorialization and they're about validation. They say that this man, and it almost always is a man. Remember, there are more statues of Queen Victoria than all other women put together in this country. There are more statues of nymphs and fairies than real, actual, historical women in this country. That it's statues say this is a great man. And Edward Coston wasn't a great man. He was a killer. He was a slave trader. He just gave a lot of money to, to Bristol. And you can, it's so easy to show that that statue was not history because if you'd stood in front of that statue before the 7th of June, it would have told you almost nothing about Edward Cox. And what could you have learnt from that statue? Well, he died in 1721. The statue was put up in 1895. We have no idea what he looked like. There's not even a likeness of him, not even a depiction of him. It says on the plinth that he was a wise and virtuous son of the city. Well, doesn't say he spent most of his life in London, that most of his slave trading activities were in London. Um, wise, virtuous, he, he, he was a slave trader, he was a killer, he wasn't virtuous. But it also says it was put up by public subscription. Now that's not inaccurate, that's actually false. It was not put up by public subscription. The public subscription failed. And we think uh, a, a member of the, Liverpool, of the Bristol elite, uh, James Arrowsmith, paid himself for most of the money to put up that statue because they wanted to create a cult of Colston, which justified them, members of the same merchant elite, having huge power in the city. None of that, none of that is visible. None of that could be learnable from that statue. And the other thing that statue said nothing about is the source of the money. It said nothing about the 80,000 plus people transported into slavery during the time he was involved in the, Af in the Royal African Company and nothing about the 19,000 that we estimated died as a result, died in the Middle Passage um, uh, as a result of, of his activities. All of that history, that actual history that you can learn through books and documents and television programs and going to heritage sites, none of that is visible in the statue because that's not the function of statues. They're about validation, memorialization. They cannot tell us history because history is fluid. It moves and it changes. We learn new things. We understand the significance of things that we didn't previously understand. And history evolves and changes. Statues are literally set in stone. They're literally cast into bronze. They are immobile by their very nature. They cannot do the job of history, which is to evolve, because that is not their function. They have nothing to do with history. They have to do with powerful elites choosing members of their inner circle and making them into figures for validation, making them into figures that justify the perpetuation of their rule and their, and their, their, their power. It's got nothing to do with history. Yeah. I mean, I think you've pretty extensively proven that sort of facts are, uh, is, is not the, the site of dispute here, really. The site of dispute is arguably who we are as a, as a people and as a nation. I mean, I don't know if you have a, want to respond to, to that sort of provocation, but basically maybe the reason that people were so agitated was not in fact because they're interested in history about what really happened. They're rather interested in what it says about who we are as a, as a people. And they feel that what you've just described uh, is somehow you know, tarnishing or self-flagellating and um, is offering a negative portrait of Britain. Well, I mean, the, the accusation that, that seems of, to be a more plausible account of why they're so agitated than they just really want to get the history right, especially yeah. when they're getting it so wrong. I th and I think there's more sympathy for that, that argument. I think it is, it is very difficult for people who have been taught the history that we were all taught at school and who believe it and who have normalized it to, to cope with the fact that historians are coming along and activists and other people are coming along and saying, actually, a lot of this stuff has not been taught. There's another side to this story. It's much more complicated and it's a lot less celebratory than we were taught at school. Um, it's a real challenge. And I think people are being also being encouraged to think that this process of re-examining history is somehow a, an attack rather than the function of history. When historians are accused of rewriting history, the answer is yes, that is actually literally the job of historians. They sit there and they look at the evidence that we have and they write new versions of it and they reassess it and they look at documents we didn't have before or assessments or understandings we didn't have again and they rewrite history. Nobody 
nobody look, comes upon a historical subject and goes, well, it's written, we can't do it again. Nobody thinks there's a, the reason, there's no reason to write new books on the Tudors because that would be to rewrite history. That is the function of historians. But I think if we have been fed a generation, for generation after generation at schools, through the heritage industry, um, I think also through television at times, a version of our past in which history is a, is a, is a safe space. It's a place we go to to feel good about ourselves. Now, not all countries have that relationship with their past. Some countries see history as a place you go for good and bad, to learn nice stories about your past and your heritage and your people and your country, but also cautionary tales. I mean, obviously, Germany has a very relationship, very different relationship with its past. At this point, I have to, I don't know why I waste my time, say I'm not comparing German history to British history. I'm comparing the way Germany's dealt with its history to the way that Britain's dealt with its history. I've said that every time I've ever said that, and that hasn't stopped the Daily Mail accusing me of comparing with German and British history. That provides them out the way for a complete waste of time because they'll write what they want. Not all countries have this relationship with their past. And if you want history to be this, this soft play area where you can go and gallivant and feel good about yourselves and think you're a unique, special, exceptional country, you need to take out of that soft play area all of the sharp objects. And the sharp objects are the chapters of our past that aren't glorious, that aren't wonderful, that isn't populated by heroes and angels, but that are tragic and shameful and, 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 and brutal. And within that tends to be the bits of history that explain the family stories and the backstories of the 14% of the population um, who are not white. If you, don't, if you want history to be uh, a soft play area, you don't want the history of the Royal Navy coming into Lagos and bombing my ancestors or going to the village my family's from in the 1890s with Maxim guns. You don't want the story of Amritsa. You don't want the story of the, of the Indian mutiny and the, and the violence that followed it. You don't want slavery. You don't want all of these stories that are the backstories that explain how our country's population came to look the way it does. So you reject it. And then when it all emerges and your soft play area is suddenly full of sharp objects, there's a there's a reaction, there's a, a quite aggressive reaction uh, and a, a, a search for scapegoats and a search to delegitimize this form of history. And one of the classic ways is to say that it's, um, it's exaggerated or to compare it to other countries. Whenever we talk about empire, someone will say, well, it's not as bad as the Belgian Congo. It's not as bad as example X or example Y. Or they will say that it is a form of self-flagellation and that, that, that it's, it's, um, it, the people who are into this history hate, hate the country. All of these contrivances, everything other than accepting that Britain, like every other nation that ever existed, did some good things and some bad things. That basic, obvious, fundamental fact, anything to get away from just having to accept that obvious reality. Yeah, and I mean, I think um, it's, a, it's a key argument, obviously, in your book that we should understand Black history, not just as a sort of, I think you said this uh, the first time I, I met you, as a minor tributary to the main river of British, but as, as part of, of British history, so that Black history uh, is British history. I mean, would you care to expand on that? Because I think it's an argument that, that really needs stating, in, 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 especially in the context of what you've just said. I mean, arguably, it's one of the reasons people resist that that claim that they want they would prefer to see they would prefer to say yeah well you're right those things happen but they're kind of a minor bit of the story yes. of who we are they're not really fundamental to the story of Britain um, how would you yeah well how would you respond to that it's a, it's a it's a powerful reflex to to want to believe that that's um, it's one of the many devices used to push this history away and disown it now geography conspires in this because slavery took place for the most part in the plantations of the new world. Obviously that's where enslaved people were profitable. Um, there were of course enslaved people living in Britain, living in, as, as servants in houses, wearing collars, being beaten. We know that because there's a great legal case over their status. But the fact that most of it takes place over there is helps people distance themselves um, from, from, this, from this history. But I think it, it's 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 more than that. The, we don't want to come to terms with this history and have the idea that it says anything about us. And we will find, as I said, any contrivance to allow us 
to do that. And geography and distance does that, but also so does focusing on the histories of other countries. Um, we are much more interested in African-American history than black British history. When black history emerged in Britain, which is really in the sort of 60s, 70s and the 80s, I think what we did is we took an American concept, African-American history, and we tried to apply it to Britain. And African-American history, understandably, is about the the lives and the development of communities of black people in America from 1619, when the first African-American slaves are, uh, are brought from Africa to the, to the present day. And it takes place on the continental United States for the most part. Black British history can't just be that because it is like almost every other aspect of our history, it is imperial. It takes place in Britain, but it also takes place in Africa. It also takes place in the colonies in the Americas and in the, in, in the new world. It also takes place at sea because we're a mar vast maritime power. So this history is, is, is global. And there's a form of black British history, which I think some people are much more comfortable with, which is about biographies of people who lived in Britain. It's about black people. And the word that's always used is contribution. Now there's nothing wrong with that. That's absolutely fine. My books are full of those stories of those black people and those communities that lived in Britain and lived their lives in Britain. But that cannot encompass the role of Africans and Africa in the story of Britain, because it's far, far bigger than that. The example that I always use is that, is that the one thing I wasn't taught at school about the Industrial Revolution, I was taught every detail about it. The one detail I wasn't told was the four and a half thousand mills in Lancashire that produced the cotton clothing that was Britain's biggest export by the middle of the 19th century. The Economist magazine estimated that one in five of the entire population, 20%, were to some extent involved in the cotton trade or the ancillary trades. I was taught every detail of that trade, except for where the raw cotton came from. The raw cotton is produced on 80,000 plantations in the Mississippi Valley and the Deep South, 80,000. And on those 80,000 plantations are 1.8 million African-Americans, half of the 4 million African-Americans living in chains in the, 18, in the 1850s. Now, that industry sends the great bulk of its cotton to Liverpool to be processed in the 4,500 mills in Lancashire. Those 1.8 million African-Americans who are servicing the biggest industry in Victorian Britain, the industry at the center of the Industrial Revolution, the industry that we are taught at school, we're all taught every other detail of water frames and spinning jennies and Arkwrights and the rest of them, but we're not taught that. Those 1.8 million African-Americans who live their lives in chains, they are the missing persons of that, that version of um, that aspect of British history. Now that doesn't come under the definition of black British history about contributions and communities because they never live here but they're absolutely fundamental to the story of Britain. And everybody, everybody lives in a country that was enriched by their stolen labor. Everybody lives in a country where the railway systems, if we were living in an easier time, I would be with you, with you Omar, today at the British Museum. And I would have come to London from my home in Bristol on the Great Western Line from Temple Meads to Paddington, a line that we know had money invested in it from the compensation paid at the end of slavery to the 47,000 slave owners. And I would have benefited from that historic injection of wealth um, into, the, in, into the country. All of us are affected by this country's exploitation of Africans, whether it was through slavery, whether it was through imperialism. It is encoded in the financial DNA of our country. It's encoded in our language, in our culture, uh, in our food. And it is far bigger than can be encompassed with a traditional, restrictive, slightly myopic version of black British history because we are an imperial power. And all I ever really do as an historian is I, I go to every subject that I encounter and I try to see it through the prism of empire. My book on the First World War is really a history of the First World War understood through empire. Um, and my, my version of black British history is to try to make it imperial because the American template just cannot function. And I think it's very noticeable that politicians are much more comfortable with that version of black British history, because that really misses out what happens on the plantations. That misses the punitive raids in Africa in the, in, during the scramble for Africa. That misses out so much of the stuff that we are really uncomfortable talking about. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, as uh, originally as an American, I, I am always struck by the sort of 
the usefulness of the analogy, but also the limitations of it. And I think you know, one thing that strikes me is, as you're speaking about empire there is the inequalities of rights and of status are so obvious in the United States because as you say, they're geographically contiguous, but because the inequalities of rights and of status were sort of geographically dissipated, we don't spot that that's just what the British state was. It was a state of unequal rights um, and privileges. And, and I think that's what's in some ways, I, I, I know you're not a subversive as such, but it is quite subversive notion of what Britain is, your claim that, you know, you're not just reclaiming black history, you're actually re reformulating how we ought to think about Britain. We, we ought to think about Britain fundamentally as an imperial power. There's there's a speech I'm I'm very interested in that um, Enoch Powell gave in 1961, and it's not the speech you're thinking about. It's seven years earlier. He gave a speech on St George's Day, and it's an incredible delusion of a speech. What he talks about in the speech is how the age of empire has come to an end, and that Britain. And it's a very interesting. Um, uh, um, phrase that he used to use about the end of empire. And it's a phrase that has re-emerged into our public discourse. He used to talk about a clean break from empire. We need to have a clean break, rather like we need a clean break from Europe now, we're told. And in this speech, he, he, he argues that those, those centuries of being an empire builder and an imperial power had unaffected, not affected Britain that the rest of the world had be caught under the spell of Britain, but Britain, and I think the, the phrase he uses, has somehow unaffected by the great structure built around it. And now it was all over, and what he called the strange races had gone, that Britain could return to its true self. And he, he, he has this eulogy, this beautiful piece of writing, you know, backward travels our gaze to the pikemen of the, of the, the 17th century, back through the, uh, I think it's the uh, the brash materialism of the Tudors, and there we find them, our true English ancestors. This idea that you had to travel back in time four centuries to before the middle of the 16th century, before, uh, before the Tudor dynasty, uh, in the early years of the Tudor dynasty, to engage with our true, well, he really meant Englishness, not Britishness, um, and that nothing that had happened between then and the 1960s had had any imprint on who the British, the British were, was it, it, it shows the intellectual contortions you need to get to, to edit the imperial story out of Britain. And it's just, the, the strange thing about it is it's so palpably nonsense, and yet actually it's so effective. The imprints of imperialism, the imprints of slavery are absolutely everywhere. They're just, they're, our, our society drips with them. And, we almost don't see them. They are almost invisible right in front of us. I mean, the, one of the examples as a West African that I'm interested in is um, the Victorian cult of cleanliness. Cleanliness is next to godliness. The Victorian cult of the soap. You know, soap's produced with palm oil. Palm oil is absolutely fundamental to the colonization of Africa. It's one of the reasons for the colonization of Africa. It's one of the reasons that the anti-slave trade suppression um, squadrons of the Royal Navy merge into the early days of imperial conquest. It's the reason, the economic reason, that British power expands northwards in the latter half of the 19th century and encounters my ancestors in Ijab uh, in, in, in in Nigeria. Because this product, this commodity, is then shipped to places like Port Sunlight in Liverpool to make the soap that is fundamental to the story of the Victorians, that people who are fighting the squalor of the slums creating this kind of this, this cult of cleanliness, which we all had to relearn as we wash our hands properly for the first time in our lives. You can't have that without empire. You can't have tea without empire. You can't have, when, when I was a child, my favorite sweets were, were Highland toffees. And it was only when I was 16 and I started reading about slavery that I worked out that this whole Scottish thing about toffees and sugars and biscuits and the sweet tooth of the Scots is entirely a reflection of the fact that Scotland was deeply, deeply involved in sugar slavery in Jamaica, but also tobacco um, slavery, um, um, slavery in Virginia. It was up to its neck in it. And, you know, it's called Highland toffee, as if the sugar cane is being grown in the Grampian Highlands in some sort of oddly warm valley or some sort of beside some lock that somehow heats it. it it's there in, 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 in plain sight. I mean, the, the, the I remember realizing that um, when I read about Scot Scottish involvement, I'm not picking on the Scots here, but it's just a good story. Um, the population, the proportion of the population that is Scottish 
in the population of Britain in the 18th century is about what it is now. It's about eight, nine percent. Um, but the Scots, because they, for all sorts of reasons, the Scots were more heavily involved in the imperial project than, than many other groups. The Scots really were enthusiastic about, about empire. And there was a lot of Scottish involvement in sugar slavery in Jamaica. So around a third of the plantation owners in Jamaica were Scottish. And that means about a third of the enslaved people were owned by Scottish plantation owners. And like all spot, um, plantation owners in the British Empire, they gave those enslaved people their family names. And I remember realizing that it was right in front of me and I'd never noticed it. My favorite band when I was a kid was the original Whalers, not Bob Marley and the Whalers, the original Whalers. Think of the names of the three black guys in that band. Bob Marley, Robert Nestor Marley, he's actually mixed race, his father is Scottish. But the others, Bunny Livingston and Peter McIntosh. McIntosh Livingston Marley. Three black guys from Jamaica who, like a third of Jamaicans, have ancestors who were owned by Scottish plantations. It's right in front of you. It's just, it's everywhere. The sweets I was eating, the, the, the music I was listening to, the imprint of empire is everywhere. Yet it is almost, almost kind of physically invisible to us. And people can't, why, I mean, there seems to be an emotional resistance as much yeah. as an intellectual one in resisting that. Because as you say, these are just, they're facts. And it's actually quite surprising that, you know, it's taken so long, for example, even to unearth, I mean, the, the excellent UCL project on the legacies of British slavery, but those, that evidence has been there since, since it was first put in the archive. Yeah, it's um, been there since the I 1830s. Mean, how do we, I think there's, there's an issue there, um, and you and I have talked about this until recently this year, I was the director of the Running Me Trust, which is a race equality think tank, and I, I struggled often to have conversations in public on race, not because the people would uh, turn it into some sort of either what we now call a culture war, but also frivolous and emotive kinds of reactions to it, unwillingness to sort of accept that I'm talking here about racial discrimination because there's evidence of it. I mean, how do we use history, I suppose, to, to excavate those stories to make people feel, is it possible to make people feel more comfortable with this history? Because clearly that's partly what's going on here, right? When people are, mm -hmm. are shouting back at you and then resisting what is, as you say, plain, and, and, and there's no shortage of evidence for it. Well, I mean, to quote one of, one of your reports, it was the, the 2016 Racial Attitudes report that said 74% of people um, saw, saw themselves as not, not prejudiced, which means that 1% saw themselves as very prejudiced, and uh, 20, let me do the maths, 23% were somewhat prejudiced. Um, I think from that, you'd have to guess there's quite a lot of people that you can't reach. And I think they are armoured with devices to dismiss people like myself. So I hate white people, I hate Britain. It's much easier to say people like me are horrible who, who I mean, my mother's white, my partner's white. If I hate white people, I'm doing it very badly. But it, forgetting facts, if you're in a fact-free zone, maybe that will wash. Maybe I hate Britain. I, I'm told that I'm interested in the history because of the racism I suffered as a child or that I'm burdened with some sort of sense of victimhood. I consider myself extraordinarily fortunate. Um, but these arguments are all much easier than actually confronting the idea that our history isn't what we were told at school. And I have lots of sympathy because it's really difficult to to confront the idea that we've only been telling partial truths about our past, that we've been airbrushing out the difficult and the inglorious chapters, that we're not a special magical country that the rest of the world wants to, wants to uh, re-embrace and, uh, and enter into empire 2.0 hand in hand. Um, it's a really sort of difficult argument. And yeah. I do... I do lots of strategizing. I mean, one thing that I'm, I, I do is when I present television, I'm quite smiley. When there are positive chapters, I make sure that we tell them as well as the darker chapters. I'm very well aware of the angry black guy trap that you know any any expression, even the vaguest hint of a frown, um, the whole there's a whole kind of armory of uh, of racial stereotypes to to to, to dismiss me. So and even more so black women. Um, so I'm very very careful about that sort of stuff. But you know, some people just are never going to accept the idea that our understandings of ourselves is partial and is the result of a centuries long process of airbrushing. And so one of the arguments, my last ditch argument is, I think it's actively dangerous 
and against our national self-interests to convince ourselves that the rest of the world sees us the way we see ourselves. And these debates about empire and race, they are, they're not dialogues, they're monologues and they're solipsistic. We talk about, we carry out surveys, was the empire a force for good or, or bad, as if we get to decide, as if we in this island can sit down and then say to the rest of the world, well, we had a big meeting and we decided it's all fine. It was all okay in the end. Uh, that, that's, that's the end of the story. They have their memories. They have their views. They have their disputes with this history. And this is what's happening in India with historians like Shashi Tharoor, who's an enormous figure in India. There's a generation of young Indians, I think for good, good reasons and bad reasons, who are interested in this history, who, who understand the argument that India was one of the richest countries in the world when the British arrived and one of the poorest when the British left. The rest of the world have their own memories of Britain. The Chinese have their memories of the Opium Wars, the destruction of the Summer Palace. There is a vast museum outside Beijing at the site of the Summer Palace destroyed by the British and French forces during the um, Second Opium War in the 1860s. That museum is one of the biggest museums in the world. Officers in the People's Army go to that museum as part of their education. They have their own memories. One of the phrases that's been used since 2016 and the Brexit vote about our place in the world is that we should rediscover our buccaneering spirit. The buccaneers were pirates. Is that honestly, sensibly, realistically, the relationship we imagine we can have with the rest of the world in the 21st century in a world in which China is a superpower? Uh, it's, it's just damaging. It's damaging to us. It, it's... It makes us look silly, and I don't think it's in our national self-interest. And I think a lot of these arguments, you know, I mean, I'd love as a sort of lefty to sort of, you know, have a more moral argument. I think it's actually, it's bad for us financially. It's bad for us economically. And, and sorry, sort of move, moving a bit practically to the curriculum, because obviously it's Black History Month, and you've done a lot of work in public education on, on television. I mean, how would you like to see the British curriculum decolonized or better taught in schools, whether that's at university or, or primary or secondary school. I mean, how, what, what, is, what is your understanding of how we teach it now and how we might better do it? And maybe, I don't know if you have any practical thoughts there as well. Well, I mean, we know that, I mean, there's 59 history modules produced by the three big exam boards. And we know that 12 of them deal with any form of black history, though some of them in some cases, that's actually African-American history. So we know that around 11% of students who study history at GCSE get any sense of, of black British history, of black history. Um, and I think in some ways, all that is, is a reflection of the curriculum reflecting the background attitudes of society, of not wanting to engage with these ideas. Um, but there's other problems. You know how unpopular history is as a subject with Black Britons. Um, it's one of the most popular subjects with white students going to university, one of the least pop popular with, with Black children. And as a result, there are a tiny number of Black students doing PhDs, which means there are, there's a no pipeline or a very weak trickle of a pipeline of Black people becoming historians in universities and writing books. And so Black people, young Black kids don't see themselves reflected in history. Therefore, they think it's not for them. Therefore, they don't study and it becomes a feedback loop. So there's a fundamental practical reason that if we want to, we want our history to be something like, we want everything to be something everyone feels has a place for them that they could be involved in. I think we're really failing from, from day one. We're failing at the curriculum level because it, Young black kids don't choose to study history at A level, and that's a real, a real crisis. Um, I think it's very powerful that um, the campaign to affect change in this area is being read by um, young black women in the organisation Black Curriculum. Um, I don't see much um, movement from governments, and it's, to a certain extent, this government's no different from any, any other. History has always been a political football. Unlike, I mean, nobody. My, my older sister's PhD is in the reports that led to the 1870 Education Act, the act that brought in compulsory education. And, you know, she's shown me those reports. And when it comes to history, it's all about how we can use history for some political outcome, how we can use it to undermine class identity and increase national identity, how we can use it to bring the four nations together. Nobody's thinking about how can we use chemistry to create a polit desirable political outcome? How can we deploy physics to, uh, to strengthen the union? So history is by its nature political. Um, but I also think we can't rely on the curriculum. There's a long tradition in this country, in post-war Britain, of 
black self education of Sunday schools, of Pan-Africanist Sunday schools. And I think that's really necessary. I think there's more books now than there's ever been. And I think the publishing industry, I hope television, I hope this tradition of black self-education is helping fill the gap. But the problem with that is, I think it's just as important that the white kids in the class get to hear this history, as well as the black kids who might hear it at home. Because it's just as important to them to understand why their class looks the way it does, why their city looks the way it does. And when I was a kid, I was asked at school, you know, why are you here? You know, what are you doing here? And I didn't have the answer because they'd never heard of the empire. We didn't teach the empire in school. That kind of natural question is why do we live in this society? Why are 14% of the population not white, projected to be maybe 30%, um, you know, by the middle of by the middle of the century? If we don't teach a history that tells that, that very basic question um, has no answer. And I think that's damaging for everybody, not just black and brown kids. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm going to move to some questions because we've got some coming through and I might. Um, so I've got one here from um, Rosie Veach uh, via LKN. So do you think that recent events have brought more people to an understanding of the phrase decolonizing the curriculum and a re realization of how much of our history is, is not taught? Well, I'm, I'm going to annoy people here. Um, I think one of the problems we have is that phrases like decolonize the curriculum are make lots and lots of sense on campuses. And if people who do critical studies, it's a nightmare in the tabloids. It's just so easy to, um, to dismiss and to mischaracterize that phrase. And I do think we'd have to say that people who care about these subjects, some of our phraseology is a hostage to fortune. I mean, defund the police means something very different from what people can say defund the police means. And it's very easy for them to say that. Decolonize the curriculum sounds like a very unreasonable demand in the, when put in the mouths of some people. Um, whereas make the curriculum tell everyone's stories, make the English literature curriculum have some books written by people who were female and, and, and not white is a much, is actually what you're saying. So some of these phrases, you know, in the, with the bad faith actors that are out there, these phrases are really dangerous. And I, I, I worry we've, we've, we've put swords in the hands of people who want to use them um, against us. So I don't think that phrase has really got much traction. I don't think many people understand it um, because it's been delivered to them um, in a sort of hostile way through hostile news outlets. The phrases, I think the ideas that have really landed this year, I think people, more people understand the concept of being anti-racist rather than just not racist. I think the idea that the battle against racism is an action, it's an active process rather than a passive, it's what you do rather than what, than what you're not doing. I think that idea has, has caught the imagination of you know, many of the people who bought books this summer. I think that's got somewhere. I think the idea of structural racism has got somewhere to a certain extent, but I fear decolonization um, hasn't. And uh, at this point, it would be great if I could come up with a brilliant phrase that say, if we only we said this, sadly, I don't have that brilliant phrase and it is very easy to criticize phrases when you haven't got the answers. But I just observe that these, these, this terminology is very easily spun around and used against us. I mean, although I suppose we can't, as you say, there's so many people of bad faith who are going to object to any uh, term that we would use. I mean, I, I, I thought that institutional structural racism would be helpful for getting people away from feeling that when you using the term racism, they feel personally affronted to you're blaming them because you're not talking about individuals, you're talking about structures. Yeah. But even that now is, I, I, well, I mean, that, I've that's been, been told, I, very I was, I was right. told that if I use the term institutional racism, that I'll get people's backs up and stop, stop using that phrase. Because it's, again, because of bad faith actors, um, it's become, when, when you say structural racism or structural inequality, what people think you're saying is that the entire country and everything about it is kind of hyper racist. They think it's just kind of like racism double plus, And that's the way it's been spun. In some ways, you know, structural racism, I think, explains the anomaly between the attitudinal studies that um, you commissioned when you were running the Running Me Trust that show this generation by generation, decade by decade, decline in open um, prejudice. 
I think it shows the, the, the contradiction between those attitudes and the fact that we live in a society in which we know in all sorts of arenas of life, um, black people and other minorities, um, their lives are enormously shaped and their life chances limited by race. The, the mismatch between the decline in open prejudice and the resilience of outcomes, in, life outcomes shaped by race, and some of it, structural racism is, is the answer to that. It explains, it was deeper. It's more structured, it's more embedded in our society. We do it subconsciously, we're all imbibed. We, we, were, we were sort of um, raised in this sort of this, this, this racialized kind of broth in our society. And it's, it's wormed our way into our thinking, all of us, black and white. In some ways, it, it, it's, it's a sort of, um, I think it, it's a very positive idea. It, it, it explains why just being anti-racist, what you're already doing, most people, isn't working and that we need to do something else but it has been spun as a as a as if it is a sort of um yet another attack it is yeah. a it, it is a um a claim of a sort of extreme form of racism rather than an analytical understanding of the way racism operates so i mean, I mean I don't right. any phrase yeah, we come up with yes. can be twisted no, I, I i agree with you i mean how else do you explain why the racist stereotypes are always the same and always predictable it's not like yeah where are people picking them up from? They're not sort of creatively coming up with them in their heads. It's coming from our, um, yeah, the, the, as you say, the sort of structural nature of racism in our society. And can, can I say something about that? I, I think we yeah. underestimate how much effort was put into creating this stuff. Yeah. The, the part of racism, some aspects of it are fueled by the, the slave owning and slave trading lobbies in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. This was the richest most politically embedded lobby in British history. This is the West India interest. They poured the equivalent of billions of pounds into propaganda campaigns that built these stereotypes. They could hire the best hack journalists. They could hire the best cartoonists like, like, like uh, George Cruikshank to bring these ideas to life. The idea of African savagery, the idea, the converse and some, somehow contradictory attitude of African childishness, all of these ideas, huge amounts of effort, decades and decades of money and thinking and planning and strategizing were pumped into creating this stuff. So I think we need to understand just how, how, how intentional this was and how much effort and money went into it, how it became embedded in popular culture. It, in, I mean, minstrelsy, blackface minstrelsy is the biggest entertainment form in the late 19th century. It, it's... Mm. It's what rock and roll was in the 50s and 60s. Um, those songs, those deeply racist, horrific songs sung by white men in blackface, those stereotypes in all of those, um, those routines that generations of people knew. Every, every night in Victorian Britain, that racist poison was being pumped into people's minds. I'm, I, we're, I'm making a program about this at the moment with my, my company. And we did, I, I asked the researchers to just do an exercise and just choose a Saturday night in the 1850s, a random Saturday night, and list for me all of the places in Britain where there's a minstrelsy act performing. And there's an amazing website that allows you to do this. And some of the, you know, very often we know what the songs were. We know the name of the troupe, where they were performing. And what you get is a list of dozens and dozens and dozens of venues in every city in Britain in which men in blackface are singing songs, racialized songs about the stereotypes of black people with horrific, loaded with racial language, saturated with hatred. That is a random Saturday night in Victorian London. This stuff was poured into our society for centuries. Of course, it's structural. Of course, it's ingrained. And of course, it's wormed its way into the ether of our minds, into our subconsciousness. And of course, it's going to take just as much effort to deconstruct it as was put into constructing it. So I think, I think we sometimes imagine that this stuff evolved naturally. You know, this was a powerful propaganda campaign, one of the best funded and best organized in all of history. Yeah, I mean, it does remind me also of sort of James Baldwin saying there's something anti-human about racist thinking that sort of also deprives the white racist of his humanity. By, yeah. you know, and there's a huge structure there that's, I think you're right, to, to, to warp. Yeah, the, the, I mean, Baldwin's absolutely incredible about that, you know. And I, I think I think Conrad um, says something similar about in in um, in Burmese days. And I think obviously Fanon and the idea of white white masks and black masks. This idea that this is damaging for everybody. Um, I mean, just just read um, read Orwell. 
about, <laughs> you know, just, 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 sorry, I meant Orwell, not Carmen. Re- read Orwell about his, he's someone who came back from the dark, basically, who saw through this and saw who he was, never quite as much as I would like him to. But, you know, Orwell's ancestors are on the register of slave owners. His father worked for the opium department of the British um, government of India, openly called the opium department because they were state sanctioned drugs pushers pushing opium into China. His family were absolutely up to their necks in the Imperial project for generations. And George Orwell was on the road. He was a colonial policeman in Burma. And he sort of came back and saw, was able to see himself and see through the mask and see the mask he was wearing. And He's kind of this one of these rare figures who is uh, capable of this act of of self analysis. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just going to interrupt because there's a few questions. We don't sorry, have much time. I, I wanna, no, I just want to make sure answers. that we have quite a few. I just try to get you three more questions at least. Um, we're obviously speaking at the British Library here on on Zoom, but um, what do you think museums and heritage organizations can do now or, or do better to make history more inclusive and help continue the momentum there? At, there is at the moment around Black British history. So, you know, what is the role here of museums and heritage organizations? And obviously, this is also quite a politically charged issue right now as well. Yeah, I think we need to rethink what museums are for. I think we need to understand that museums are part of the colonial project. And that has become normalized. The idea that the art and the culture and the artifacts of other peoples and sometimes the human remains of other peoples are objects of study that it is legitimate for the art of peoples who were part of empires who were conquered to exist only in Western museums. That's a horrific idea. And it's been normalized to the extent that we we can't even notice it. Um, There's a thing which I always think is a great thing that British people should do is if you go to the the Rijksmuseum, in the Rijksmuseum is the stern piece of the, the Royal the Royal George, which was one of the battleships taken during the second, third Anglo-Dutch war from Chatham. And it is there with a lion and a unicorn. And it is, it's a kind of British thing taken from Britain in a foreign museum. Yes. And I think whenever it people in Amsterdam, they should go and stand and just, it feels a bit weird. And then remember that half the world feel that in the British Museum. Hmm. That, so... Another one, as it's Black History Month as well, um, go, you know, and this is, I think, a long-standing issue. But going forward from 2020, uh, sh- should we continue with Black History Month, or should we str- make more of a commitment to marking a last ever Black History Month in the future? To because what we need to do is ensure that everybody's learning about world history and British history, which includes everyone's history, you know, the whole year round. See, I don't think it's a duality. Um, I was reading in the summer a very good book about the Jewish presence in Britain, and that's Jewish history, but it's also British history. And you can write books about Black British history, and you can write books that integrate that history into the wider story. I think you can have both. Um, I don't think anybody feels that they shouldn't be reading a book about the Holocaust or teaching children about the Holocaust because it's not Holocaust um, um, uh, Remembrance Day. There's lots of, I mean, these are, I think these are useful devices. They are, and I think increasingly it's becoming a celebration. I think that's really, really positive. It's becoming much more British and much less American, and it's becoming celebratory the way the pride is celebratory. Nothing, when people say we want Black history, you know, 12 months of the year, well, nothing's stopping us. You know, you, you don't have the book ripped out of your hand on the 1st of November and go stop that for another year, you, we, 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 we can do that. But I think it's perfectly useful to have a month in which we celebrate things because it does, it does a really important thing. And I think if you work in, in journalism or in media, you understand this, it gives people a reason to say, why now? Yes. Why, why should we do this now? That's one of the questions an editor or a commissioning editor will always ask you. There's lots yeah, of stories we can that, do. That, why, that why now? quite nicely to another question from Julie, which is uh, where, where are the biggest bottlenecks in communicating and learning about black history. Is it in the curriculum or is it instead with publishers and what they choose to publish or is it on print and on screen? And obviously as someone who's chosen uh, to use TV as a medium, I mean, what, what do you think are the biggest bottlenecks then in terms of communicating uh, black I history? I think the, the, the bottleneck doesn't lie in any one sector. It, it, it lies in the capacity of people in different places within the historical ecosystem to blame each other. So television is full of people who say, well, there's no black historians on television because 
well, they don't get the universities aren't promoting them. Or they'll say the publishers aren't publishing their books. Therefore, what could we possibly do? There are people running um, festivals who will have no black people appearing uh, um, in those festivals. And they say, well, you know, it's the fault of the publishers. It's the fault of the, of the promoters. Everyone is blaming somebody else in the history ecosystem. Now, fundamentally, there's a problem at O level at GCSE and there's a problem, problem with A-level. There's a problem getting black kids to want to study this at university. But something can be your not your fault, but it's still your problem. And these excuses, these, this, this capacity to say, well, we could do our bit if only they were doing their bit. Everyone passes the buck. So I, I don't blame anyone, industry, publishing, television, um, universities, no one's got a stand. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to squeeze in one more question Please also, go. because I've noticed your tilt on social media where you've started uh, rebutting people sometimes quite elegantly, yeah. but it's, uh, I mean, there's a question here that social media algorithms have radicalized many more people. And I think it's, it is true. It's something I've observed too. It happens to me on social media uh, that increased white supremacy rhetoric and racist tropes are making money, however, by feeding these algorithms and that, bots are making the most racist comments online. Um, you know, what do you, she's asking for your views on that, but I'll, I'll push you a bit further. I mean, are you not feeding the troll and making things worse by rebutting what is either bodish or white supremacist nonsense in which people are, yeah, it's, sorry, uh, yeah, it's making yeah. it worse rather than better. Well, the vast majority of time when people say it's a bot, it's not. Um, and we've done some investigations in that and it, you know, it's not. and even if it is a bot, that's still a racist robot that somebody has programmed. And I don't find that very comforting. People say it like I should be com comforted. Yes. I think it's fine to, and I think the right thing to do is to rebut this nonsense, this nonsense, because it is nonsense. What I think would be wrong is to engage in an argument of name calling and aggression and anger. I think trying to make fun of it, trying to point out how ludicrous this is, trying to link things to articles. I mean, there's nothing annoys somebody who's got a racist meme than you linking them to an academic uh, paper and saying, oh, you should read this. It's more complicated and I think you'll find you're wrong. There's nothing annoys them more than that because the big thing that I discover with all of these, these attacks is that the one thing people will not do is any research or reading. They will say the most awful things, they will alienate um, people online, they'll, they'll involve in you know, hate speech, which is on the verge of being illegal anything other than reading a book. That is the last thing, the last resort, the one place they won't go. So some of this stuff is just paper thin nonsense. And I think it's important. I think it also quickly does another function is black people are constantly told that racism is not as bad as they think it is and that they're making it up and they're being oversensitive. And what I find is when I retweet what people feel it is okay to say to me behind anonymity on a social media platform, that lots of people say, I didn't know that stuff was there. I think it's important. I think there's a function. As long as you aren't shouting, as long as you're trying to use facts and, you know, when you can humor, um, I think it plays a function. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong. You know, it's so I, uh, my strategy. It's what I've tried to do. Yeah. Uh, final question, I think, from the audience here is what steps do you think our society needs to take in order to begin to consider the complete picture of our past? So a big one to end there. But what are the next steps that, you know, we need to take uh, as, a, as, as a society? To, to give the more complete picture that you've provided in your books and in your programs? I think in some ways it's, it's going to happen generationally. I don't think there's a step that can take. I mean, we, we, if we look at the, the attitudinal studies we have, young people are far less likely to believe these racist tropes. They're far less likely to be upset by the idea that Britain did bad things as well as good things. And I think it will organically happen by itself. The big threat to that is, as you said earlier, is the algorithms, um, which have the capacity to divide us, the capacity to take away a shared space and even shared realities more than any technology I think that's ever existed. And I think we need to be really frightened of the capacity of algorithms, which are there, as you say, to make money, to make money for the people who've, who've designed them and destroy the societies or wreck the societies that um, that they've embedded themselves in. And of course, it's not just social media action, but things, action on the streets in terms of things like face recognition, software, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, I think we've got one minute left. I, I believe um, the British Library wanted me to uh, play a final video uh, to, to, to thank you all. It leaves it to me 
Unless, David, do you have any final words you wanted to, to end on? Otherwise, I'll, I'll move to... Uh, just thank you, Omar, for, for this evening, and thank you, everyone, for watching. Yes, and obviously, I've, it's been a huge audience. It's been a real privilege for me to speak to, to David like this for an hour, but it's, it's been made possible by so many of you being interested in this topic, and I think it speaks to the fact that, um, you know, the power of David's voice, but also of the argument um, that Black history is British history, um, and it's great to have that conversation in this depth this month. I just wanted to thank again the Living Knowledge Network uh, for their help and thank the British Library uh, for organizing this. And I'm now going to uh, close the event and I believe there will be a short uh, video uh, thanking you again and good night. Thank you very much, David and Omar, for being with us this evening. And thank you very much, our lovely audience. Special thank you to those of you who joined us via the Living Knowledge Network. Please donate if you can. To find out more about our events program, do visit our website. Thank you, guys, and good night.